I love coral reefs. I love how each coral looks like it's a plant or a brain, but it's actually more like a high-rise apartment or a neighborhood for thousands of tiny little animals called coral polyps. And each of these polyps thrives off the energy of even tinier photosynthetic algae living in their cell tissues. This relationship between the coral polyp and the algae began 500 million years ago. And it's the foundation for the most biodiverse ecosystem on the planet Earth today. And not only that, coral reefs have gone extinct before, numerous times, and they've re-evolved. Sure, it takes them 20 million years or so to do it, <laughs> but they come back. If that's not resilience, I don't know what is. In the summer of 2011, I came across a scientific prediction that said coral reefs would collapse globally in 2016, and that they're likely to go extinct by the end of this century if we don't take immediate, serious action to address climate change. I felt devastated. I didn't want to believe it, but these predictions are coming true. The Great Barrier Reef has collapsed by 50% since 2016. And more reefs as well are dying because the ocean is heating up too much for too long, causing what is called coral bleaching. The domino effect of this one climate change impact alone is enough to crack the foundations of civilization as we know it. About one billion people depend on coral reefs for their food and their income. Reefs also help protect coastal areas from storm surges, which we know are getting more frequent and more intense due to climate change. I don't want to see the coral reefs go extinct within my lifetime. I want my grandchildren's grandchildren to know their beauty. Can you imagine a trip to the aquarium in 2112 where the parents and the teachers are saying, well, maybe in 20 million years, we'll see one of these in the wild again. Nobody wants that. So we have a choice to make, and we have to make it soon. Scientists are telling us that human activity are the greatest cause of the climate change happening today, and that by ignoring this, we're quickly creating a scenario in which climate change will spiral out of our control. So what do we do? By we, of course, I'm talking about we humans, but I'm particularly talking about we humans who depend on fossil fuels for what we eat, for how we travel, for how we thrive as a society. The eco-Buddhist philosopher and author Joanna Macy describes our civilization as the industrial growth society. Growth is our imperative, Production is done on massive industrial scales, and we treat the earth largely as our resource commodity to exploit and the dumping ground for our waste. Joanna Macy lays out three lenses through which people see this present moment. The first lens is business as usual. This is the widespread celebration and commitment to progressing our industrial growth society. Most of our economic theories, political debates, and media that we consume is from this lens. But like an optometrist checking our vision, Joanna Macy asks us to look through two more lenses. The second lens is called the great unraveling. This is the acknowledgement that business as usual is causing massive social and ecological crises. A lot of us are stuck in business as usual, and we're in denial about these crises. And a lot of people get stuck here, too, at acknowledging that we have a big problem, but we feel totally helpless and unable to do anything about it. I know I've been there. I'm sure a lot of you probably have, too. The third lens is called the great turning. And this is the perspective that humanity has both the power and the potential to shift from business as usual 
to a more just and life-sustaining society. This is a vision of active hope and determination. As Erin Dottie Roy put it in her book, An Ordinary Person's Guide to Empire, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Each of us has a role to play in this historic moment. Our first and most difficult task is to move through denial and despair towards a resolve and readiness to change. This shift first happened for me when I was a student studying abroad in Costa Rica. I ended up enrolling in a mural painting class with an environmental muralist by the name of Esteban Camacho Stevenson. Esteban had found a mural, a wall for us to paint at a public school in San Jose. The students at this school wanted to see a mural of the ocean. Now, this is again in 2011. I am completely concerned about the degradation of the oceans. In fact, you could say I was in despair about this. So when Esteban innocently asks our little class what we might want to put in a mural about the ocean, this stream of environmental issues that I'm overwhelmed about just pours out of my mouth. Esteban was so gracious with me in this moment. He just started asking questions and making sketches of the things that I was saying. And we ended up making a beautiful mural about the connection between humanity and the ocean. Painting this mural was the most therapeutic thing I've ever done in my life. With every brushstroke, I was expressing both my love for the ocean and my despair over its abuse. These things stopped weighing me down and they were released into the world, transformed into something new, something beautiful that was creating new impressions and ripples as a part of people's everyday landscape. Art has this amazing ability to help us transform and help us to heal. It can communicate across intellectual, emotional, and spiritual levels. And action, particularly action done in community with other people, is also so uplifting. And it's a really important part about being alive. So these two things, art and community action, have been like guideposts and guiding inspiration for me ever since this experience. In 2012, one year later, a group of landowners and activists in East Texas launched a campaign called the Tar Sands Blockade, and they were trying to physically stop the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline through East Texas. I was blown away by the boldness of these people, and I was also upset about the violence and intimidation that they were experiencing at the hands of the TransCanada Corporation and the sheriffs in East Texas. I wanted to go out there, but I had no idea how to be a tree sitter or a blockader. But I knew how to paint, and I knew how to edit videos and take pictures, so I joined them. There are no drill pads or factories or refineries where I grew up. We just have headquarters for corporations that own those sorts of things. <laughs> So I had never met anyone myself who was affected by land grabs or public health effects of fossil fuel extraction until I joined this campaign. I quickly became to learn about the names and the stories of the communities affected by tar sands mining in Alberta, Canada. These are First Nations indigenous communities, the Athabasca Chippewyan, the Beaver Lake Cree. I came to know closer to home the names of communities along the Gulf Coast of Texas who are poisoned by the factories and refineries that these pipelines lead to. Manchester, Port Arthur. The people in these communities didn't grow up like me. They don't look like me. It became impossible for me to ignore the fact that race and class are the biggest predictors of how polluted someone's community is. We take for granted a healthy environment 
the same way that we take for granted good health until we don't have it anymore. But this analogy falls short because you can't pass off a personal sickness or an injury onto someone else the way that we're systemically passing on our environmental toxins and degradations to some communities so that other communities can be more healthy and more wealthy. Environmental justice is a vision for a world that doesn't do that anymore. It's a vision for a world that is, is more equal. And it's a movement led by the people who are most affected in order to stop this from happening. This requires a cultural shift towards what Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King described as the beloved community a radically deeper love and accountability towards one another and the places that we call home. Perhaps climate change is the final act in this multi-generational epic of environmental injustice. Those who are most responsible for causing the climate crisis are currently feeling it the least because they're buffered by the comforts and wealth of our industrial society. Those who have done the least to cause the climate crisis are currently feeling it the most. These environmental justice leaders are telling us that the earth is sacred and has rights of its own. They are asking us to recognize that if we con continue to treat the earth first and foremost as a resource commodity to exploit, and second most, as a dumping grounds for our waste, then we will fail to address a root cause of the climate crisis. Are we ready to listen to them? After all, this is an enormous cultural clash for us to reconcile. Our way of life is built upon centuries of parceling up and commodifying the earth, and centuries of trying to dismantle or eradicate any opposing paradigms to this. And yet still in 2018, we see communities and particularly indigenous nations who oppose this worldview and who practice alternatives. And considering the fact that 80% of the remaining biodiversity on the planet is in indigenous territories, they may have an idea or two worth spreading about how we could restore ecological balance on our planet. We each have just one life and limited bandwidth. So we have to start small with ourselves, with our perspectives, relationships, and communities. But we also have to think big and come together, bridging these barriers of race, class, gender, cultural divides, any that you can imagine, in order to implement solutions on the scale that is needed. One small way that I've begun to do this in my own life is by working with my neighbors in Austin, Texas, to develop a public food forest. The Festival Beach Food Forest is an edible and medicinal landscape on public parkland in the heart of Austin. We've converted an empty field of Bermuda grass into an abundant community commons. Every sprig of rosemary and lavender, every pecan and fig and pomegranate on this park belongs entirely to everyone. The food forest puts free food on people's table. It pulls carbon down from the air into our soil and water down to replenish our aquifers. Can you imagine a world where instead of relying on a food system that needs fossil fuels and pesticides and workers getting $6 a day for hard labor, we can rely on abundant edible and medicinal landscapes in our neighborhoods? All over the world, there are people who are implementing solutions like this. Solutions that are grounded in the values of environmental justice and the strength and creativity of community partnership. Yes, the challenges humanity faces today are daunting. They are massive. 
I hope that as we face these things, as we move through our own denial and despair about them and move towards a readiness to change, that we can look to the coral reefs for inspiration and a working model. The beauty, abundance, and resilience of coral reefs is built upon millions of small acts of cooperation and mutuality. Perhaps we can save the coral reefs and billions of other lives too by organizing ourselves in such a fashion. After all, we are in this together. Another world is totally possible. So let's make it happen. Thank you.